Now, what do you say we make a terrarium and take our minds off things, huh? Here's what you're gonna need. A big jar, ask a parent. Some small rocks, a couple handfuls of nice, dark dirt, a few clippings of moss or weeds, some medium-sized rocks that are pretty to look at, maybe some natural mushrooms, dead leaves, and a watering can. We'll start from the bottom and build our way up. Place a layer of small rocks at the bottom of a jar. This represents the hard layer of earth that lies just beneath the surface. Now, what part of the biosphere would that be a part of? <laughs> That's right, the lithosphere. Now go out into a garden or a park and collect some nice dark soil. You can use a shovel or even just use your hands if you're like me and like to get a little dirty with it. Just be sure to wash them afterwards. A place to find this soil could be near a stream or a body of water. I did most of my collecting for my own terrarium by the lakes in Prospect Park. Anywhere where there are lots of plants already growing is a good place to find healthy soil. Now before you place your dirt on top of the rocks in the jar, try to find some dead leaves on the ground and crumple a few of them up to mix with your soil. These leaves will continue to decompose and provide your soil with additional nutrients. Once you've mixed your soil with your leaf chunks, gently scoop it onto your rock layer, being sure not to pack the soil too tightly. Just allow it to loosely rest on top of the rocks. Your soil should stack up about a third of the total height of your jar. Now's the time to unleash your inner designer and snoop around for some aesthetically pleasing rocks to simulate the rock formations that form on the top layers of the lithosphere. Look for rocks with cool features like visible strata, meaning layers, or vibrant colors and arrange them carefully as if you're stacking up a mountain range. Now it's time to give everything a little spritz. You can use a watering can, or better yet, a spray bottle, to gently wet the soil and rocks. 
providing much needed hydration to our mini biosphere. Can you spot where each of the three spheres of the biosphere are represented in our terrarium? even as we're just getting started putting it together. The lithosphere is what we spent the most time on. It's all the rocks and dirt that are stacked up at the bottom of the jar. The atmosphere was kind enough to show up without a lot of effort on our part, as all of the air that pulls into the jar from the surrounding world serves to provide the terrarium with a mini atmosphere of its own. Finally, we added a little spritz of the hydrosphere in gently watering our terrarium. Join me next time as we delve deep into the science of ecosystems, and stay tuned till the end of that video where I provide more tips on how to keep building up your terrarium, including what plant life is best to pick and plant in your miniature world. For Guru, I've been Peyton. Cowabunga, Earth Kids. We're going to be looking for two kinds of plants to make up the bulk of the life in our terrarium. Weeds and moss. A weed is a fast-growing plant with very few needs, like a clover or a dandelion. You'll often hear gardeners complain about weeds growing too fast and taking over all their crops. But their ability to grow quickly is exactly why they make perfect terrarium residents. Moss is easy to spot as it looks fluffy and green and often grows on the side of a tree or by the water. Take small samples of your plants. Don't grab a whole fistful. And using your fingers or a pair of tweezers or even chopsticks, gently seat each clipping into the soil. Time to put your designer hat back on as you get to decide where to insert your plant life within your terrarium. I like to imagine you're designing a full-scale ecosystem. And think about where plant life would naturally grow if I were looking down on a big valley between a couple of mountains. The most important thing is to experiment, have fun, and use your imagination to create your own miniature world. Here's a little bonus step. Take a look around for a natural growth of small mushrooms. They often grow very close to the very same weeds and moss that we targeted for the plant life in our terrarium. But be sure to check with a parent before you touch or plant any mushrooms, as some can be dangerous to hold. By no means should you ever eat any wild mushrooms either, as some are incredibly deadly. Once you've cleared your mushrooms with a parent, you can plant them much the same as you planted the moss or weeds. As a tip to increase their success, sprinkle any remaining dead leaves onto your mushrooms, as fungi are decomposers and will feed directly off the nutrients in the dead leaves. Finally, with your small rocks, soil, pretty rocks, plants, and fungi all assembled and looking their best, Gently water and spray the soil until it becomes a rich dark brown. Careful not to overwater, as that can be as bad for plant life as receiving no water at all. A good rule of thumb is to stop watering before water pools up around the edges of it. But if you do accidentally overwater, don't sweat it. Just wait a little longer before watering again. It's up to you whether you want to close the lid or keep it open, but the terrarium will do fine either way. Continue to water it every few days, and you'll be amazed at how quickly your mini biosphere springs to life. Your terrarium includes all of the essential components of an ecosystem. The abiotic factors of soil and rocks provide places for the plants to grow and nutrients for them to absorb. The sunlight permeating through the clear glass of the jar charges the plants with energy to perform photosynthesis and generate food as producers in the ecosystem. When the plants eventually die, they will decompose into the soil and the nutrients will be consumed by the fungus who act as consumers in the ecosystem. As long as you continue to provide the ecosystem with water and sunlight, it will thrive and flourish, just like a real-world ecosystem would, with all its parts clicked into place. For Guru, I've been Peyton. Peace out, Earth Kids. That's about some review. And as a fun twist, I'm only gonna ask for answers from one fake name for this final quiz section. It means a lot less cringing for the rest of us as you won't have to watch me sweat trying to think of names on the fly. But intense discomfort for all of the audience members who do, in fact, have the name I picked. Are you ready, Brandon? Good, let's begin. Multiple ecosystems which share common abiotic factors are called, that's good, Brandon, biomes. The two main types of biomes, having to do with whether they exist above or below the water, are called what, Brandon? That's right, Brandon. Terrestrial and aquatic. Terrestrial being spot on, Brandon, on the surface. Leaving aquatic to mean, oh, perfect, Brandon, under the sea. Finally, what is the process called whereby an animal moves from one ecosystem to another as the abiotic factors of their home ecosystem change with the seasons? He don't miss. Four for four, Brandon. Incredibly well done. Well, that about wraps things up for today. 
What's that, Brandon? Oh, the terrarium project. Oh, my stars, I'd almost forgotten. Oh, what do you say we take a look and see how things are progressing? By now, your terrarium should be somewhat a thriving ecosystem, as long as you've made sure to provide organisms within it with the abiotic factors that they need to survive and thrive. Now is a good time to take stock of what might be out of balance in your miniature ecosystems. Are the plants looking a little limp, brown, or dry? Try spritzing a little more water, but be sure not to add too much. Overwatering can be just as dangerous as underwatering. What about the fungal life? Looking good and shroomy? If not, try adding some additional dead leaves from a backyard or nearby park. Remember, fungus are the zombies of nature and can only survive off of the decaying flesh of other organisms. Once everything is looking well cared for in your terrarium, all that's left to do is upkeep and observation. You can keep our little experiment going for as long as your little heart desires, continuing to water and tend to it, until that day at which you decide, I'm rather bored. At that point, and here's the fun part, you can just dump it back where you found it. I issue one last challenge, however, before you resolve to dump our little terrarium back into that big one that we call Earth. Do a little research, perhaps using Google.com, and see if you can tell me what biome our terrarium most closely resembles. Remember, in addition to what life has been able to thrive within it, take stock of what abiotic factors are affecting its ability to foster life. I'll give you a little hint. The biome of your terrarium is bound to be similar, if not the same, to the biome that you currently live in. See if you can crack it to gain a little additional perspective on how humans fit into this vast and various natural world. For Guru, I've been Peyton. Ka-chow, Earth Kids.